All right. We good? All right. Day four. Fortunately, like I said, my throat still. Uh, I'm sure at four o'clock on Wednesday, I'll be completely better. I'm, I'm sure that, that'll be the, the timing. But for now, I still need the most spiritual person in the room to pray for us. Or no, definitely the most spiritual. So, all right, I'll have to check. Who's the most spiritual person in the room right now? It's not working. I'm not getting anything. So, so I, uh, you're a Christian? Good, thanks. <laughs> all right. All right. Thank you. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for the ability to be here and learning from your word. And thank you for Dr. Lewis and his lifetime of study. We pray that you would open our eyes and open our minds to behold wonderful things from your law and from your word. And we pray special grace on Dr. Lewis's vocal cords and apparatus mm -hmm. that he'd be able to share what's in his heart to share with us, what we need to know to be equipped to serve you. And we bless all our minds to understand and think and focus in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. We'll send 20 bucks to Benny Hinn, too, just to hedge our bets. <laughs> so... So, yeah. So, get that get that hundredfold return, man. We're uh, we're ready. All right. Let's uh, let's see here. Start the drowning process for the day. All right. We are on Christology, and. On this, uh, sounds like such a wimpy lecture. I'm sorry, man, but it's just, <laughs> I got to get a better voice. You can't, yeah. I mean, I mean, come on, a, a Christ can whoop a fully realized avatar or a Buddha with one nature tied behind his back. I mean, come on. So we just have to. Why, yes. Can I take it so I can get you some tea? Yes. Let me bend this a little bit here. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So. <laughs> okay. All right. So we're on Christology. And by the way, are you guys good with the speaker over there now? It's not blasting your ears. And Okay, good. So, yeah, some of you, some of you guys going this every time the, the speaker goes off. It's not good. <laughs> All right, Christology. So we ended yesterday, we looked at the doctrine of sin and looked at the results of sin. And now we have a Christ, we have to have a Christ who can save us. So went through some of the basics yesterday, but now pa we're on page three of the handout. And just a couple of issues here, you know, with... <laughs> With, uh, like with theology proper, we're looking at more than what God is. You know, like we're, looking at, we're looking at what he can do. So we're looking with Christ, what is Christ, ontological Christology, and then we're looking at what he does, functional Christology. But the big question is what uh, Peter asked in Matthew 16. Or Christ said to Peter, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So, and as I mentioned with the cults of Christianity, it's really only with Christianity that you get a whole bunch of different versions of what a Christ is. You know, where you find that in Islam, people don't have a lot of different versions of what Muhammad the prophet is uh, or what a Buddha is. But only with Christ, you get him redefined. So let's answer the question because there, as Christ warned, there are lots of false Christs out there. And given the uniqueness of Christ for salvation, you want to make sure you get the right one. So look at some of the various Christ, and again, since the Mormons are wrong on everything, we'll start with them. Right. <clears throat> LDS. Um, 
who do they believe Christ is? He's one God among many. And as a savior, he only guarantees, why am I holding my bottle like a microphone? That's just weird, so. Okay. Um, in LDS theology, Christ only guarantees resurrection for everyone, but, he, but everything, anything to do with salvation itself, individual salvation, is 100% by your works, okay? So he's not really a savior, okay? The JWs, <coughs> who is the Christ? He is Michael the archangel, okay? Who, in the end, gives some kind of ransom. He ransoms his body, and then that enables you to work your way into paradise, okay? Now, the... The liberal Jesus voted no on Prop 8, of course. So, um, but uh, no, the liberal's Jesus is a mere man who was just an ethics teacher. Okay, so here he's a ethics teacher, and mind sciences. <clears throat> Christ is an idea or an ideal. See, in Gnostic systems, you have Jesus the man, and then you have Christ, which is an ideal for something that everybody has the potential to tap into. But Jesus figured out the way to tap into this Christ ideal more than anyone else, okay? So, as we go through, I mean, literally, we could give several dozen ideas of what a Christ is um, for the Christ of the UFO cults. He's literally some kind of space alien, okay? And Usually the cult leader is the reincarnation of the space alien or the second coming of the space alien. Uh, but this is where we see the warnings that have come. Second uh, Corinthians 11, 13 through 15, uh, we see that we're warned that, th that uh, you'll get a different Jesus, a different spirit, and another gospel. So you have to be careful about it. So, and it's just endless, the amounts of Jesus, you know, the amount, the, the number of Christ that are claimed. Or again, we can keep adding to this for new agers, okay? Who's the Christ? You know, he's basically an avatar who's coming to, to save the world. So, but yet there are people who call themselves new age Christians and Jesus is their avatar. So, so, <clears throat> so be on guard, uh, as the scriptures say, because there are lots of different ideas about Christ out there. Now, next on page three, the very concept of Christ. In the Old Testament, Christ, the Christ, was really known as the Redeemer okay, of mankind. And he was the one who was going to come and deliver us from the bondage of our sin. And we really don't see the word Messiah and appearing until Daniel 9. And Messiah, from Mashiach, means anointed. So, the anointed one. That was the one. Uh, he was the one who was coming, who is the anointed one. But what's the significance of the anointing? And in the Old Testament, by and large, there are three categories 
of leaders who had God's anointing. They were empowered by him. Prophets, priests, and kings okay, were the ones that received God's anointing. And so the idea of the anointed one is the one who is going to combine all those three offices. Okay? He would be our prophet, priest, and king. And looking forward, we see that this is Jesus. But looking back, who was, <clears throat> who was the one figure who also fulfilled this? Moses. Okay? Look at the function. A prophet declares the will of God to the people. A priest goes to God and intercedes in behalf of the people and offers sacrifice. And the king is the ruler over the people. Okay, was supposed to guard the kingdom in righteousness. So, in this case, now, after Moses, these offices were separated. Okay, you had certain people who were prophets, certain ones who were priests, certain people who were kings. But see what Moses do? He went, he revealed God's will. I mean, he gave Torah. Okay, he was the priest. He went to God in behalf of the entire nation of Israel, and he was the sole ruler of the people. So, and in Deuteronomy 18, you see a prophecy. Moses said, one is coming after him who is like him. Okay. Which the Muslims say that's, that's uh, Muhammad. But actually that's a prophecy of the coming of Christ because Christ is the one who is like Moses. He unites these three offices. And <clears throat> just a note, um, if you look at these, now, what is emphasized in the New Testament? What's emphasized in the New Testament, for the most part, is the priestly ministry of Christ. Okay? Why? Matthew twenty twenty eight. He came not to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom for many. Okay? The, the purpose is for sacrifice, for sin. Okay? Now, Modernists, liberals, postmodernists don't have a whole lot of use for the doctrine of the sacrificial atonement. Okay? So the liberals completely got rid of it, so Christ is only a prophet in their view. Okay? He's only a way shower. This is what's emphasized by modernists and generally postmodernists. The Bible believers focus on this rightly because it's emphasized in the in the Bible. And then the kingship of Christ, he offers the Jews the kingdom of God. It's rejected. So where do we see Christ's kingship? We see it in the book of Revelation when he finally consummates his kingdom. And here, um, probably the most, one of the most important things to understand here, when we say Christ is a king, don't superimpose modern standards of a monarchy on that. You know, we, we look at the Queen of England right now or something like that. It's like, give me a break, man. That is not the concept of royalty here. Uh, in the ancient Near East, if you were the king, you were a warrior king. okay? Because the king was the one who could protect his people from evil and vanquish the enemy. Okay? And that's why he was the leader of the people. So, and you look, go to Revelation 19. And this is where we see Jesus, the warrior king, coming in his full uh, awesome and fearsome power because he comes riding on the white horse. And what, it talks about the pools and rivers of blood uh, that are going to occur by for him vanquishing evil and vanquishing the enemy. So just because he comes the first time, in peace, uh, you know, riding on a donkey doesn't mean he's not powerful and he can't vanquish the enemy. So, so that's the that's the stuff that you know we again. Me, by the way, meek doesn't mean weak. Okay, 
Yeah, meek means power under restraint. That's what meekness is. And fools confuse meekness with weakness. So, and that's the, um, again, just a, so as we think about the very nature of what a Christ is, um, that's what's going on, who Jesus Christ is. He is the, the one who is the ultimate prophet. How do, I mean, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He's God incarnate. You, you can't reveal God better than that. Okay. Priest, he not only offers sacrifice, he is the sacrificed. Okay. And then the king, uh, well, God is always king of the creation, but Jesus is the ultimate king. He's king of kings and lord of lords. He, he's the king and always will be of all the earth. So, so this is the the real Christ, uh, who is God incarnate. So, all right, as I set my lozenge for a minute, give me a minute here. Um, all right, bottom of page three, um, necessity and purpose of the incarnation. And I've already mentioned this a number of times, but why we need Christ to be both God and man, and it's simply for the sake of our salvation, um, ultimately we need him to be God because the offended party has to do the work of salvation we need him to be man because he can't do the work of salvation or pay the price for sin because the price for sin is spiritual and physical death hence we need a God man okay? so we need him as fully God and fully man okay? um more on that later. Now, page four. Okay. Sorry about the marbles ro rolling around here. Um, I said, I'm sure at 4.01 tomorrow I'll be perfectly healthy. I just count on it. I'm sure it'll work out just that, just fine. All right, a couple of things historically. Um, Christians have been trying to formulate ideas about this stuff, about Christ, you know, for, you know, they had tried for hundreds of years, and we still try to, in the vein of faith-seeking understanding, come up with better ways to describe who Jesus Christ is and what he did. And when we get to these kind of statements, of course, the church always believed he was God, but when it was challenged, we needed to have a clarification statement, so we got Nicaea, okay, 325 A.D., and we got Homo Usia, that Christ is the same substance as the Father. <coughs> Had to affirm this because um, if you're going to be a monotheist, he not only has to have the same kind of substance as the Father, but numerically the same one. Now, now, okay, he's fully God, but then the church is thinking, but how is he a God-man? And there are a number of attempted explanations uh, on how he's a God-man, but the problem with any almost any heresy is that it's incomplete. He usually it tries to formulate a statement about God or Christ, but leaves something out. Okay. And so with Christology, after these attempts to explain Christ, we finally, 451, we got Chalcedon. Again, the entire church gets together and says, no. Okay. Uh, all the attempted explanations don't work. Here's what you have to say about Jesus Christ. Okay. And so we'll go back and put God in our box again. Okay, so true God, true man, one person, and divine and human natures remain distinct. And so the thing is, no matter what else you say about Christ, you have to say that. Okay, that is the, uh, again, the sine qua non of Christology, 
without which not you don't have an orthodox Christology. Okay. So it's the essential Chalcedonian criteria. So Chalcedon says he's homoousia with God and homoousia with man. So in other words, reaffirming Nicaea says homoousia with God and adding, thank you, sir. So oh, thank you. You can give Jimmy a cheer too. Ooh, 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 ooh. Oh, thank you. Jimmy's the man. So thank you, Jimmy. So all right. Well, now I can scald the back of my throat and everything. It'll, it'll work out just fine. Okay. So now, as we see here, uh -oh, hold on. Okay, so Chalcedon affirms that four basic criteria. Let's skip over to page five. I won't read the creed right now, but it, it's, it's helpful to read. If you actually... I mean, this, uh, the way the creeds were written, they're not only accurate, but they're actually good literature, too. They're, they're very well written. Um, um, uh, I mean, think about the difference. See, it's clear that we're all the same, okay? Or we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Which one is, is literature and which one is just a plain statement, okay? So... Again, part of making a powerful statement for something is to think about the literary quality as well, you know, and how it makes uh, the point better. So, and again, the creeds, the people who drafted these, again, not only do we get the language from the better thinkers, but we got the best writers, too, to put this stuff together. So that's why they stand the test of time. But, again, a couple of key, I'll, I'll read some key points of the definition here of the Chalcedonian Creed on page 4. And note, let's just start here. It says, no, I'm not going to read it. Give me someone else who's going to read it. I'm going to save my voice. Anybody hear it? Okay, good. You're a Christian? Thanks. I appreciate that. So <laughs> go ahead. We, then following the Holy Father, all of one Corinthians, teach men to confess one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, as the same perfect and Godhead and also perfect in nature. Truly God and truly man. Any questions? So. <laughs> now, you might want to know that this actually would look good in your church bulletin, you know, in your doctrinal statement. You know, you're probably not going to have a more precise statement 
and actually, was it that hard to understand? There might be a couple of words there that, uh, you know, what's the subsistence mean? But, you know, it probably wouldn't be a bad thing to include in your church doctrinal statement, uh, your statement about who Christ is. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's pretty well done. So, but note, again, what it affirms, page five, he's true God, true man, one person. And the idea that the, divine, that the natures are distinct. Now, again, <coughs> remember when you're drawing up a doctrinal statement, a creed, a confession, or something like that, you have a purpose in mind. You're, you're trying to include things and exclude things you, you already have in mind. So now we want to state it to purposely mandate or include certain ideas and exclude certain ideas. That, that's the entire point. So, uh, they added language, for example, they already had the Nestorians who taught Christ was two persons. So, what they add, he, the two natures are distinct without separation and division. <coughs> well, now, they, now the Nestorians can't affirm it. And the two natures are distinct without change or confusion. So, now the Eutychians or Monophysites can't affirm it. Okay, So... So there's the lesson in how to, you know, put together a creed. You have to, uh, again, well done. Now, that's where you move to, okay, how many possible ways now can you get it wrong about Christ? Okay, well, while the names here are the classical names of the heresies, um, most of them are still around in one form or another. And... Um, and you're going to find that there are those that reject true God or true man <coughs> or one person or the divine and human natures remain separate. So look at page five. And Ebionism uh, was one that early Jewish heresy that rejected the deity of Christ. Okay? And... Again, it's a big problem. Anybody do evangelism to Jews, that's still a big problem, trying to uh, convince Jews that Christ is God. Okay. So it's still an issue. Uh, or dynamic monarchianism. What is dynamic monarchianism? It is monarchianism that's dynamic. Okay, <laughs> That's the... Uh, like, dude, thanks, and I paid for that. Man, that was, uh, I want my money back. So, yeah. Dynamic monarchianism. Uh, remember in our Trinitarian studies, what monarchian views are, right? Uh, monarchian view from monos, mono, one, RK, ruler, okay? So any monarchian view says God is only one person. Okay, that's what a monarchian view is. Now, the modalistic kind says the one person who is God manifests in different modes. Okay, that's modalism. Dynamic, where comes from the Greek word dunamis. The word means power. Okay? Where we get the word dynamite. Okay? Boom. So, so dynamic monarchianism says there's a man, Jesus Christ, who is empowered by the monarch for his ministry. So he's a mere man that's empowered by God uh, to fulfill his messianic mi ministry. So that's Dynamic monarchianism, so we'll put that here, dynamic monarchianism. But these are the ones, they don't deny he's one, that Jesus is one person or that he's true man. They're just saying he's not God. Okay. So, so moving forward, and you might want to note that modernists are the ones who are going to tend towards dynamic monarchianism. Also, Arians. Okay. Um, 
And you might know that spell with an I, not a Y. Okay. Um, yeah, it's not, you know, Aryan Brotherhood and things like that. So, yeah, th these weren't fourth century white supremacists who, uh, yeah, the, uh, the Aryans are still around today, although the Aryans around today aren't as smart as the Aryans back in the fourth century. Um, Jehovah Witnesses, probably, you know, the, probably one of the better modern examples of, of Arianism. And Arians taught that the, let's see here, okay, they taught that, now the term logos is what we see in, uh, in the Gospel of John, especially John 1.1, 1, 1. the beginning was the word, okay, so it's the logos, it clearly designates a person. Now, the Arians designated him as the Son Logos, but they said he was a created person. And in their Christology, they had a uh, Alexandrian uh, Christology, but they're also trichotomous, so they had uh, body, uh, spirit, soul. Well, For the Arians, <coughs> they had Jesus as one part created Son Logos, but the Logos takes the place of the human soul of Christ. Okay? So in their view, he's two-thirds human and one part created Son Logos. Okay? So they're messed up on multiple levels, okay? Um, so the Logos, I said, basically takes the place of the rational soul of Christ. So he's neither fully God nor fully man. So Arians get honorable mention in two categories. Um, so because they have a diminished humanity for Christ. They also want to note, too, that there's a tendency, the ones... Uh, for example, the, the, the heretics who tend to have a lower view of Scripture and a higher view of their own rationality tend to become dynamic monarchians. And then the ones who at least give lip service to the inspiration, authority, and inerrancy of the Bible, like Jehovah Witnesses, tend to be Arians. Okay? Why? It's actually pretty simple because you can't read the Bible and see that the person who is Jesus Christ didn't exist before he became a man. It's just, you know, Father, glorify me together with the glory I had with you before the world was. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. So that's clear as crystal in Scripture that he pre-exists. But the Arians can't handle that he's fully divine, so they make him a pre-existent created being. Okay, so yeah, and so, but they're going to be f try to be faithful to Scripture on those other areas, just not in the area of the deity of Christ. So you tend to see those who, like I said, at least give lip service to the inspiration, and authority of the Bible. They'll probably be Arian. Uh, those who are big on their own rationality will end up being dynamic monarchians uh, and just reduce him to a mere ethics teacher. So, so that's the Arianism. Now, page six, Apollinarianism, and there's a handout on this because this is a good, uh, this is a good look at basically the necessity for the humanity of Christ to explain Christ, uh, how Christ works. There's actually only one difference, classically, between Apollinarianism and Arianism, and you know what it is? It's this. There you go. Now that now you have Apollinarianism. Okay. See, in the uh, classic Apollinarianism, Apollinaris was a Trinitarian. So he's got uh, a divine Logos who takes the place of the rational soul 
of Christ. So you have this diminished humanity. Now, why do they do that? Because in their mind, Christ would be two persons if he also had a rational soul. So, which is again why they say in, in the creed, specifically to exclude Apollinarianism, it says he is of a reasonable or rational soul and body. You know, it's directed directly at Apollinarianism. So, now in the, in the, if there were a dichotomous view, you know, it would be okay, the God in a bod view. Okay? There's nothing here. It's just God who takes on a hominid body, uh, and that's all you got. But now let's, let's look at this because this becomes instructive for us in the necessity of the humanity of Christ to explain Scripture. And again, you'll have a lot of time to discuss this in the fall uh, discussions. But um, I'm going uh, so to quickly go through this. Um, page one of the Apollinarian handout. And also, also, God, man. <laughs> I was looking at monothelitism, and I said also, so, all right, monothelitism, all right, which means one willism, okay, that Christ only had one will, so there's a diminished capacity, Christ, okay, he only has one will. Now here, um, bottom line is, the Apollinarian monothelite position does not account for Christ having humanity like ours. Why? Start with, the human rational soul is a created substance bearing the properties of a created thing that is mutable, finite, and contingent. And Scripture says, Hebrews 2, that Christ's humanity, he was made like us in all things except sin. Right? So he can be a merciful and faithful high priest. So, now if you... Uh, skip down a little bit again there's just statement after statement John 1 14 Christ the, the idea that Christ the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us and there flesh clearly means more than just a hominid body okay for example uh, if you look at uh, John 1 13 it talks about the will of the flesh okay so it's considering all of human nature incarnate, not just the body. That's represented by the flesh there. Um, and again, so the idea, he has to become that. He doesn't, he doesn't have it in heaven. He can't truncate his divine nature. He can't do any of that. He has to become human because he's not human. He's only divine. So in Hebrews 2, um, it also to, says of Christ that he partook of flesh and blood. Uh, Philippians 2, he took on the form of a servant, being made in the likeness of man. So, again, just statement after statement that he is these things. Now, we get to the functional part. Look on page 2. And just a couple of things that become necessities for, for Christ to be like us. Okay? Uh, and again, just skip down to uh, page 2, B2. It says of Christ, what? He was tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Okay? Yet, James 1.13 says, God cannot be tempted. So, now, is temptation a matter of a body? No, temptation is a matter of the soul. You know, to appeal to your intellect, to, to have an appetite for something, a desire, that, that's something that requires a soul. Okay? Bodies without souls are corpses. They can't be tempted. So, so the ground of temptation is simply going to be uh, the, uh, the, the human soul. Yet, if all you have is God and a bod, how can God be tempted? Okay? So you can't account for the temptation of Christ. Uh, number three, okay, um, the denial of Christ's human soul destroys the ability for Christ to serve as a representative to God on behalf of mankind. So, for example, um, how does he actually offer up his, his obedience in our behalf? 
for example, Galatians 4.4, 4, what does it say? It says, Christ was born of a woman, born under the law, in order that he might redeem us from the curse of the law. Now, again, the idea is that it's necessary for him to be born under the law. Now, if God is the law, how is he under the law? Unless he's got a human soul and he's a human that requires obedience to the law. Okay? But yet, that's made it necessary for our salvation. Same thing with uh, physical death. Again, if he's just a uh, divine person united with a hominid body, it's not a real human death at that point. It's just God departing from a body. <coughs> okay. Now, the big one, top of page three, um, how can Christ die spiritually for our sins if he doesn't have a real human soul? Because certainly we didn't end up with a binity for three hours. You know, we have this eternal relationship with the persons of the Trinity that stopped for three hours. Yeah. Because the idea of the darkness descends for three hours, and that's you know, the, the timing or the phase of his spiritual death. Then he says, it is finished. So at the end of the three hours. So that, that's the, just the timing in the Gospels when the darkness covers the land. Uh, so, and that's just very symbolic of what's taking place is Christ's spiritual death. So that's the three hours. So, so that's the, um, the background there. So, so he can't actually do the work of salvation without a human soul. And then bottom of page three, um, again, just li even, we might think of little things, but the Bible makes no sense unless Christ has a human soul. For example, Christ prayed to the Father. That's an act of a human who has a soul. God doesn't pray to God. Um, even bigger here, uh, notice that Jesus had faith in God. God doesn't have faith in God. Okay. Um, uh, the idea of trusting God for something uh, indicates that he simply has what? Would have some kind of limited knowledge, and he's got to trust that God will follow through with it. So, and then finally, very strange stuff, the anointing of Jesus with the Holy Spirit um, uh, without a human soul. How is Jesus receiving the Holy Spirit? So now the Holy Spirit is indwelling is in, in a new sense other than perichoresis or that already mutual indwelling. Now God's indwelling God in a fourth sense. Okay. Would that be a new intertrinitarian relation? Yes. Yes, it would. So, uh, so now we have four members of the Trinity, right? So, yeah, so, th so this is where, again, people think they're trying to solve a problem. Here's all the problems they create just trying to solve one problem with Apollinarianism, uh, which means it makes no sense of the scripture. It's like a, a modalist um, s removing the distinction of the three persons of the Trinity. You can't read the Bible and make sense of it without the, the, the simultaneous distinction of the persons of the Trinity. So this is where, again, just in a nutshell, so for many reasons, uh, including these, which is why the entire church has reject, rejected Apollinarianism, which uh, these are all the things that, in effect, we need a full humanity for Christ to be our Savior. So, all right, so uh, Arianism, bad. Apollinarianism, bad, okay? So just write bad next to all these, so anyone wants you to do that. Yeah, real quick. It depends what you mean by singular. Does he have a divine yes. Has a human yes. Okay. Yeah, the monothelite view eliminates truly Christ's human intellect and will. <coughs> but that was also rejected because if he doesn't have a human intellect and will, then he's not a, a full human. And also he can't say something... Let this, come, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, thy will be done. So he's got a human will, and he's, you know, he's got a divine will. There's a, there's a single divine intellect and will that the Trinity shares, you know, which, which we already talked about this in ECD1, which results in a single set of omniscience, a single, a single divine decree. And, and yet, 
Christ says, not my will, thine be done. So you need a second mode of willing and mode of thinking there to even say something like, not my will, thine be done, to petition God. So, so that's the, uh, again, that, that's part of that. Now we're, now we're going to cover a little bit more on that when we get to the hypostatic union, but real quick, we have to move on. We're going to get to that, so hold on to that. That's going to be the humanity um, issue, but so you don't lose your faith between now and then. I remember, remember emptying that word, that verb, kenosis, its object is two participles, by taking the form of a servant and being made in the likeness of men. That's what the emptying was. It's defined as simply the incarnation. That's what the emptying is. So if you just follow the grammar of the passage, we know what the emptying is. He became a man without ceasing to be God because it says huparkon and morphetheu. He didn't stop being God. So, so, so again, and that's why, sadly, a lot of this stuff theologically, people just don't take the, the plain, clear meaning of these things. They're trying to look for some hidden... It's like people trying to do you know, numerology in the Bible or, you know, uh, secret messages, equidistant letter sequencing. I mean, it gets, almost gets that bad, you know, where, uh, you know, let's find the secret stuff. Why don't you just read the plain stuff that's there? And, you know, then we don't have to talk about what he gave up. God can't give up anything by very definition that he's perfect and immutable. So otherwise he wouldn't be God anymore. And it doesn't say he gave up anything in the passage. So uh, it just says that he took the form of a servant, was made in the likeness of men. And the parallel language of morphe theu to morphe dulu, you know, whatever he is and continues to be in the form of God, he's also in the form of a servant, which is the form of man. <coughs> he's got a human nature. So, all right. Number five on page six, docetic Gnosticism. different kinds of Gnosticism, this kind here taught that Jesus um, couldn't have had a real human body because uh, according to this, these, this Gnostic theory, the good God is spirit and the bad God created the material world to trap our little sparks of divinity in it so we couldn't get back to the good God. Basic Gnosticism you need to acquire enough gnosis or knowledge okay, during your lifetime so that when you die, you can escape this maze of angels, demons, and you know, impediments that the bad God has put in your place so you can get back to the pure good God and not get reincarnated back in the physical world and suffer. Okay. So those are the basics of uh, Gnosticism. So... According to this Christian, quote-unquote, version of Gnosticism, see, Jesus could not have taken on a physical form in any way, otherwise it would have corrupted him because material stuff corrupts us. So, so and arguably, it's, you read some of the commentaries on this, um, this type of Gnosticism was around in the late first century, uh, and the Apostle John is arguably addressing this in first john that's what we have seen that which we have handled that's what we have touched um he indirectly is doing polemic against this kind of gnosticism and you read some of the church history accounts again you know first century in rome you know you basically had you know, the roman empire you had bathhouses where people went to cleanse themselves not the kind of bathhouses we think about today uh but you know one of the stories in church history is that Serinthus was a one, one of the leading Gnostics of the day. John was in the, the found out he was in the same bathhouse with him, and he runs out because he thought that the you know the lightning of God would come upon the building because Serinthus the heretic was in there. So I'm sure that was a sight to behold. <laughs> so uh, so. But you think about that, taking that seriously. John didn't even want to be in the same place as the heretics. <laughs> Uh, you know, how, how seriously do we take that kind of stuff? You know, of course, you want to witness to them, but that's about it. You know, what fellowship does light have with darkness? So, so all right. Nestorianism, um, 
Now, in this case, all this stuff you can develop a long time, but Nestorianism, uh, ne <coughs> Nestorius was actually a patriarch and a leading teacher uh, that taught the Antiochian Christology. There's actually some good historical evidence that Nestorius didn't actually teach Nestorianism, but his opponent, Cyril of, Cyril of Alexandria, uh, was able to you know, tag him with that and, and to be a heretic. So he got a heresy named after him. And when arguably what was really going on is he just taught Antiochian Christology using indwelling language and you know those sorts of things. So, so probably yeah, Nestorius got a bad rap uh, uh, on this, but there is a heresy that is that Christ is two persons and it destroys the incarnation. So we have to make sure the Logos remains a a single person in our con conceptions. Otherwise, Jesus is a God and dwelled man. Hence, he's merely human. He's nothing more. Jesus is nothing more than just a human being okay, who's indwelled by God. So, and when, see, now why is that significant? I don't know, on multiple levels, but how about that uh, when uh, Thomas in John 20 bows to him and says, my Lord and my God, because he identifies him as God. So, you know, so it's significant that he's not just a God and dwelled man. Otherwise, everybody should bow down to us, right? And say, my Lord and my God, because we're God and dwelled people as well. So, yeah, that, by the way, it doesn't make you God. I hope I, you know, I, I know I enhanced your self esteem for about two seconds there, but it probably didn't work. So, so again, uh, Apollinarianism uh, is here. Uh, now, <coughs> um, so that's an historianism. Eutychianism, uh, also called monophysitism. Why? Uh, like all these is because the guy who popularizes the heresy gets it named after him. Uh, you know, and that's true today. You know, if you've studied uh, liberal Old Testament scholarship, you've heard of the Wellhausen Graph documentary hypothesis. Okay. Or, you know, J E D P, right? Uh, you know, well, we look at the Old Testament, and there's some people who use that name Jehovah, and some people use the name Elohim, and then then there's folks, you know, the Deuteronomistic historian. There's people who just want to sacrifice everything, and uh, you know, there must have been four different traditions those Hebrews had, and this brilliant scribe Ezra, about the fourth century B.C., wove all these traditions together and created the Bible. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think so. Homie, don't play that game, man. So, <laughs> so, again, seriously, it's like, I mean, people just looking, I mean, they're invent, literally inventing this stuff out of nothing. There has never, ever been a single manuscript discovered or, or any indication that says there's a separate tradition. And several people, I think C.S. Lewis was one of them, has said, if they apply the, Vel, uh, the Wellhausen graph document a hypothesis to his own works, that he'd find out he didn't write half of his own books. So, because <laughs> again, you, you look at someone like C.S. Lewis, he's writing, you know, Chronicles of Narnia, you know, The Problem of Pain. You know, well, there's different themes here, so there must be a different writer in a different school. No, it doesn't. No, it, it just means there's different themes. That, that's all it means. So, but point is, is that, yeah, well, I don't want to go too much into this. Anybody here thinking about going on for doctoral work? Yeah, be cautious, okay? Uh, well, one, because it costs money, but, uh, um, but the other thing is that the problem is when you have to do a doctoral dissertation, especially in, in a field of Christianity, you're supposed to come up with something new to, to, to contribute to scholarship in the field. And the problem is when you're sitting there trying to reinvent the wheel, you're, you're really not reinventing the wheel, okay? Um, yeah, again, it's rare, but it happens that someone can have a further insight you know, that hasn't been stated or understood before in the history of the church. But you know, someone comes up with their new theory 
uh, about things. Usually we just spend 20 years trying to fix your problem because uh, you went off and you know published and got some cult started or some heretical movement. And uh, so that's why a, a lot of folks today literally are going to, in, in theology, are doing uh, either going and, you know, doing historical theology degrees, or if you do a systematics degree, you can't, again, you can do further work. You just have to be very careful that if you say something new, it really is biblical. <laughs> so, you know, because, but that's a general problem with academia. Um, all right, so Eutychianism, all that to say, when we think about that, this was really the result of the Alexandrian version of communication of attributes in the abstract. Basically, you have these properties that are abstracted and made into one nature, okay? And so again, the term for that is monophysitism, one naturism, okay? And uh, Eutyches is the one who popularized it. So monophysitism is the little brother of monophysitism. Um, or in the sense, or actually monothelitism is the one willism that is sort of the junior version of Apollinarianism, where Apollinarianism is just, we completely get rid of the human soul uh, of Christ. The monothelite view says, we'll get rid of the will. Well, the problem is you get rid of the will, you've got to get rid of the intellect too. So essentially you're saying, well, he's got what? He's got, he's got a substance, but no faculties in it. You know, doesn't even make sense uh, at that point that you're going to take away those rational powers. So, all right. So those are the basic Christological heresies. And as a general rule, there aren't a whole lot of new heresies that are invented. But since the Mormons are wrong about everything, okay, <laughs> um, I mean, really, they, I mean, they came up with a new one that Christ is really just... He, it's a polytheistic view. See, the serious Christians are trying to deal with monotheism here, but what did they invent? Well, he's just one of billions of gods. He's a limited god who's the offspring of heavenly mother and father. And, um, of course, you've all heard that, you know, Jesus is the spirit brother of Lucifer who became the devil, right? Sorry to inform you, but so are you, okay? Uh, because remember we talked about this yesterday, all those spirits in the preexistence? You're one of, according to the Mormons, you're one of the spirits in the preexistence. So, you know, Jesus is literally the firstborn spirit of heavenly mother and father. But Lucifer was the second, Adam was the third, and your number, you know, 329,921,721 stand in line. So, you're also a spirit brother of, or sister of Lucifer who became the devil. Okay. <coughs> and so, yeah, for Mormons, occasionally I do have Mormon friends. I don't have any right now, but uh, um, <laughs> yeah, but they moved away. So, but, uh, you know, you know, it, you know, but, but I tell them this stuff, you know, you know, I remember back on Kolob, I lent you some stuff and, you know, I, I, I need it back now. Okay. Come on, man. You know, Pay up. I think I lent you a hundred bucks back on Kolob. Well, then pay up, man. You owe me. So, all right. So, okay. Let's um, let's do this. Um, all right. Um, anybody need a break now? Are you good? Yes. I'll take that as a yes. Okay. Then, uh, all right. Let's take about a five-minute break. <laughs> <laughs>